Hey everyone, welcome to the UNC Neurosurgery Med Student Primer Series. I'm Marty Piazza, I'm one of the neurosurgery residents. Uh, and today we're gonna talk about some uh, fundamental things that are important to know about craniosynostosis. synostosis. So what is craniosynostosis? synostosis? It's the premature fusion of the bony sutures of the skull resulting in abnormal head growth. Um, there's a male predominance and it occurs in one to 2100 to 2500 birds worldwide. Um, this abnormal head shape is obviously going to have implications for social development as patients get older and they look different from their peers. Um, and in particular, in multi-suture synostosis, uh, there is a concern for in development of increased ICP and brain development problems as well. Normal suture closures occur at different periods depending on uh, the suture. Uh, the posterior fontanelle, which is the junction of the lambdoid and the sagittal sutures, usually is the first thing to close, and that occurs at about one to two months of age. Um, the next is the metopic suture between the two frontal bones, and that can occur between three and nine months of age. The anterior fontanelle usually closes around one year of age, uh, and the coronal suture usually closes before two years. Um, the sagittal and the lambdoid sutures can close anywhere um, between a 20 to a 40 year old um, and may never close in some instances. In the next few slides we're going to review the different unilateral synostoses uh, from most to least frequent and then we'll go over some um, multi-suture synostosis uh, syndromes. So the first single suture synostosis we're going to discuss is scaphocephaly, and that's premature fusion of the sagittal suture. It's the most common single suture synostosis, and since the sagittal suture is closed, um, the patient cannot grow in the coronal plane, I mean, they can't grow out, so they'll develop elongated heads um, with significant frontal bossing and the characteristic scaphocephalic shape or boat shape in Greek. Um, this can also be called dolicocephaly or elongated head. And here you can see um, that elongated head and the frontal bossing. Next, let's uh, discuss metopic synostosis. Now remember, this is the first single suture to close uh, between three to nine months. Uh, however, it can close very early and cause this triangular head shape. Um, here, as you can see on the picture on the right, or trigon encephaly, triangle shaped head. Patients will oftentimes have a pinched forehead and inter the interocular distance may be quite small. Um, one term you uh, will hear frequently when using used to describe head shape for these patients is the metopic ridge. Um, it is oftentimes normal to have a small amount of ridging as the sutures close normally. However, um, this is significant um, for metopic synostosis as they have, a, they have a very large ridge and a triangular point, um, as you can see here in the axial blue on in the right. Um, and, and this is what we mean by metopic ridging. So coronal synostosis is the premature fusion of one or both coronal sutures resulting in the inability for the head to grow in the AP direction. This results in forehead flattening of the affected side. In this case, the patient's left as well as a raised eyebrow on the same side. This is oftentimes called a harlequin eye, um, which is a result of the abnormal orbit shape. The synostosis can also be associated with a uh, subtle contralateral nasal deviation, um, which is hard to see here, but it is present. And here's just a picture from uh, above, noting that uh, forehead flattening on the patient's left. Lambdoid synostosis is quite rare. As you might guess, it's a unilateral fusion of the lambdoid suture resulting in flattening of the head. Um, as you can see in this photo, the patient's right side is flattened. Um, there's contralateral bossing, and the ear on the ipsilateral side is pulled inferiorly. Um, you can't see here, but you'll also notice that on the affected side, the ear will be pulled posteriorly as well. Um, you will also see on imaging that the mastoid uh, will be inferiorly displaced on the affected side. As with other stenostoses, this is a surgical condition. However, it is easily confused with pos positional plagiocephaly, um, which does not need surgical treatment. On the next slide, we're going to talk about how to distinguish the two. So positional plagiocephaly is a positional flattening of the occiput due to infants lying in the supine position. It's exacerbated by them favoring one side or the other um, in conditions that force them to favor one side, such as torticollis. 
The important distinction here is that the suture is not fused, so there's no surgical release that's needed. Uh, usually this resolves on its own and the child becomes more mobile, um, but uh, sometimes patients will uh, get helmet therapy to help speed this process up, um, potentially create an even more favorable result. Now, both positional plagiocephaly and lambdoid synostosis result in flattening of one side of the head, but they're very different conditions, as I mentioned before, and require dramatically different treatments. Um, so how do you distinguish the two? So as you can see in this figure here, um, the, uh, the essentially positional plagiocephaly pushes the entire affected side forward. So you'll have ipsilateral frontal bossing, a forward pushed ear, and contralateral occipital bossing. In contrast, lambdoid synostosis results in contralateral frontal bossing and parietal bossing with a posteriorly and inferiorly displaced um, affected ear. Oftentimes, the easiest way to make this distinction is to look at the, the baby's head from above uh, and see which way the ear is pushed. So if the ear is pushed forward on the affected side, it's positional plagiocephaly. If it's pushed backward, um, then it's lambdoid synostosis. So let's talk about uh, some of the more common genetic multi-suture synostosis syndromes. Uh, the first one is Cruzon's. It's a uh, spontaneous autosomal dominant FGFR2 mutation. Uh, it's in 1.6 per 100,000 births. It's characterized by maxillary hypoplasia, proptotic eyes, hypotelarism, sensory neural hearing loss, restricted airway, and developmental delays. There's an increased risk of shunt-dependent hydrocephalus in these patients, but interestingly, there is a lower rate of mental retardation um, and compared to other craniofacial syndromes. APERT syndrome is another uh, sporadic autosomal dominant FGFR mutation uh, resulting in multi-suture craniosynostosis and craniofacial syndrome. Um, it occurs in one uh, in 65 to 85,000 births um, and is characterized by synostosis, polysyndactyly, uh, mid-face hypoplasia, a beaked nose, bulging eyes, hypotelarism, hearing loss, breathing difficulties, and developmental delays. These patients are at an increased risk of MR, but at a less uh, risk for development of shunt-dependent hydrocephalus compared to uh, Cruzon syndrome. So the third most common craniofacial syndrome associated with multi-suture synostosis is Pfeiffer syndrome. This is also an FGFR mutation, and it occurs in one uh, in 100,000 births. It's autosomal dominant as well, um, and it's characterized by turibrachycephaly, or a short and tall head, um, due to coronal and sagittal suture fusion, um, bulging eyes, hypertelarism, maxillary hypoplasia, and hearing loss. Um, these typically have uh, wide and short thumbs and toes, um, and there are three types increasing in severity and can be associated with a cleveland shuttle or a cloverleaf skull, um, which results in premature fusion of the coronal, sagittal, and lambdoid sutures, as can be seen in the middle picture here. Patients with a cloverleaf skull need to be treated much sooner than ones with fewer fusions, um, as there's no room for brain growth to compensate for the fused sutures. Now treatment. Um, so endoscopic repair uh, is reserved for single suturectomies of sagittal or unicoronal uh, synostosis. It is best done around three months of age, but can be performed up to six months in rare cases. There is minimal blood loss and is usually well tolerated um, with only one to two nights in the hospital. It requires 12 to 18 months of helmeting, um, 23 hours a day, um, and oftentimes weekly helmet checks. As such, um, there is certainly a socioeconomic consideration in choosing this type of repair, um, as it puts quite a bit of uh, responsibility and strain on the family um, for frequent visits and helmet and wound care. So an open cranial vault reconstruction is best done around six months of age. It's maximally invasive and often requires a blood transfusion. Uh, it's typically reserved for patients that present late, have multiple suture synostoses, um, or the post-op care for an endoscopic repair is not uh, feasible for whatever reason. These patients typically spend one night in the ICU to monitor blood volume uh, and spend three to five days in the hospital. 
There is significant post-operative eye swelling um, with this procedure and that can understandably result in quite a bit of discomfort for the patient. Um, once the swelling improves, usually on day three, um, uh, eyes are visible, this discomfort improves significantly and patients usually go home that day. Um, no helmeting is required after this procedure. Here are our references. And if you'd like more information about future educational content, please follow us on uh, Twitter at UNC Neurosurgery. Thanks.